IP routing is one of the very most important topics for CCNA. In this video, I'll just introduce it, but keep in mind that you're going to keep learning more and more about it and master this topic. Let's jump in. So here's where we're headed in this video. First, we'll talk about how subnetting helps IP routing and then how routing protocols aid IP routing because those topics are all intertwined. Then we'll move on to the specifics of routing first from a host perspective. Yes, hosts have routing logic and then routers routing logic. Now this content is also covered in what's now chapter three of the current edition of the volume one CCA official cert guides. That chapter, Fundamentals of WANs and IP Routing, has three major sections. The middle one is called IP Routing. Now stick around to the end as usual. Think of yourself as in my CCNA study group. I'll give you some advice of where to focus about this material. I'll point to some review and revision tools right here at the channel related to today's topic. And then I'll point to some things in the book. All right, let's go. The people who made up IP addressing had routing in mind when they did it. So what's that all about? Well, first off, there's an identifier, a subnet ID like this and a mask for each subnet. And formally, those define the addresses in a subnet. Now, in this case, I haven't gotten to how that works yet, if you've just been watching my videos in sequence, but take it from me, those numbers together mean all addresses that begin 1012. Those are the addresses in that subnet. So you could have a couple of servers like these who have addresses that begin 1012. And you could have another subnet down there off of router R3, and its subnet ID is 10130 with a mask of slash 24, which you'll learn later with some subnetting math means all addresses that begin 1013. So, of course, you could have some devices in there, and they'd have addresses that have to conform to that set of rules to have their addresses begin 1013. Why does that help routing? Well, now routers know where those addresses are. Rather than having to have knowledge of every last address in each subnet, they could have knowledge of the subnet ID and mask in one line in something called a routing table. And that routing table will list that subnet ID and mask, and it will have information about how do I deliver packets to that destination subnet, meaning those addresses better be there, right? So a router is going to interpret those two numbers, subnet ID and mask, as meaning begin with 1012, addresses that begin with 1012, or 10130 slash 24 as addresses that begin with 1013. The people that made up IP define routing on routers so they'd use a routing table, and the routing table could take advantage of this idea of grouping things into subnets. So let me walk you through that. So here on router R1, it's got some interfaces, the neighboring routers have IP addresses, and those end up in routes in R1's routing table. And here's what R1's routing table looks like. So R1 in this routing table that it will use to forward packets instead of having to have a matching entry for every individual IP address, maybe there's 200 IP addresses in that top right subnet. It doesn't need 200 entries in its routing table. It needs just one, one for the subnet ID and mask. And what does that subnet ID and mask represent? All addresses in the subnet. So any packet entering R1 with an address that begins 1012 is going to match that route then what does R1 do with it? Well, the next two things are the, quote, forwarding instructions. Out what interface do you forward the packet and to what next hop IP address, what next router? And I'll highlight those. Here comes that packet. The outgoing interface is R1's gig 001 if the packet is, say, destined to server 21. And the next hop IP address is R2's neighboring IP address. That way, R1 can have only two routing table entries in order to match packets sent to hundreds of addresses in subnet 2 and hundreds of addresses in subnet 3. Everybody uses dynamic routing protocols, but just to make the comparison, you could instead use static routes. What does that mean? You type the routing information. So if you think about the information in those routes we just saw, the subnet ID, subnet mask, outgoing interface, and next top address, you could type that information in for each route. But consider this simple design. Got 100 routers and say there's 100 subnets, and you want all your routers to have a route to every subnet, which is pretty typical. Get this, 100 routers times 100 subnets is 10,000 separate configuration commands spread across your network to add static routes for all the subnets on every router. And just to belabor the point, 200 routers and 200 subnets, 
40,000 routes, 300 routers, 300 subnets, 90,000 routes, 500 routers, 2,000 subnets, a million routes. So yes, it would be beyond ridiculous to try to use static routes for all those subnets. Instead, here's how a dynamic routing protocol works. First off, consider R2. It's directly connected to subnet 10120-24. This is the same R2 we've been talking about earlier. So as soon as that's configured, R2 knows a route to that local subnet. It's called a connected route without using a routing protocol. And then using a routing protocol, it can advertise that route to router R1. So it lists the subnet ID and the mask and a metric, a meter of how good this route is. And R1 can take that information and other information and create that route we've been looking at for subnet 2. Add a route to 10120-24, outgoing interface this, next top that, the same numbers we saw before. So dynamically learned. And then R1 is going to turn around and advertise that information to the next router. By the way, it'll add a little bit to the metric. So the further and further away a router is from subnet 10120, the higher and higher its metric is going to be. So that's the general idea of how a dynamic routing protocol works. And just to show you another example, here's subnet 10130. Now we're showing router R3, but still it's R1 learning about subnet 3. So R3 knows about this subnet because it has an interface connected to it. That's a connected route. Then it uses a routing protocol to advertise a route to subnet 3 over to router R1. R1 adds a route to subnet 3 without going outgoing interface gig 002 to next top address 10.1.13.3 and advertises that route to its neighbor. So what's this dynamic routing protocol thing about? Well, there are four main functions of them. First, they advertise routes and learn routes. So you run some code on a router. You just configure the router to enable it. And it wants to learn, but it also, to help others, it will advertise like we just saw. In addition to that, it has to choose the best route amongst many if it learns more than one path. So if there's redundancy, it says, hey, I found two routes to subnet 2, which is better, and it picks the one with the lower metric. And then if there's redundancy and the network topology changes, you know, a router fails, comes back up, link fails, new link comes up, it rechooses the now current best route, and we call that convergence. For instance, with convergence, think about R1's route to subnet 10.1.3.0. There's redundancy in this case, so maybe the routing protocols have worked and R1 has chosen a route that refers to R3 directly as its next hop. Now let's say that link fails, so the routing protocol's job, one of its jobs, is to figure out, oh, now my best route is the one running through R4. Hey, just a quick interruption. These videos work great with my official cert guide books. If you've not looked at those before, if you'll start with that link and click on products, you'll find out more information about them. And if you end up buying that way, I'll get a few dollars back from the bookseller at no additional cost to you. It's a great way to support the channel. And of course, I always appreciate that. All right, back to the topic. Hosts have routing logic. They even have a routing table. But the logic is pretty straightforward. It's two main branches by default, which is this. If the destination IP address is on the same subnet as the sender, send the packet directly to that other host. And if it's not, send the packet to the default router, expecting the default router to know more information so it'll forward the packet to the correct place. All right, it's pretty straightforward, but let's talk through it. So we'll focus on host A's logic, and host A will be configured with an IP address and mask. Then host A does a little bit of math to figure out the subnet ID. It calculates that subnet ID. It adds a route to its routing table for that subnet ID and notes that the next hop is not really another router. It just says on link, meaning, hey, this is the subnet that exists on this link. All right, so the math comes out to be subnet ID 10110 in this case with that same mask. And by the way, just a few facts about it. I know we haven't gotten to it yet in sequence in this course, but... There's the subnet ID, and then there's a calculation of the last number in the subnet, which is called the subnet broadcast address. So for this route, the subnet ID and subnet broadcast address are the low and high end of the address range. All right, so having that route in its routing table, here's an example of the logic. Say A wants to send a packet to B, and B's address is also going to be in that same subnet because of this topology. I know that. So A builds this Ethernet frame. A can't send just the IP packet across the Ethernet. It's got to be encapsulated in an Ethernet frame. So that IP packet 
has B's IP address as the destination IP address. It's in the same subnet. So when A builds this frame, in order to send the, send the packet directly to B, it puts B's MAC address in the Ethernet header. Then any LAN switches will forward this frame so it arrives at B. Therefore, B receives the packet encapsulated in the frame. Just another example, if A wants to send a packet to C, C's IP address is going to be in the same subnet, so the destination IP address is going to be C's IP address. The logic being, hey, the destination's on link, let me send that packet directly to C by encapsulating it in this Ethernet frame. The destination MAC is C's MAC address in that case. Now back to host A, and it wants to send a packet to S21, server 21 on the far right. Now, host A doesn't really have any perspective on how far away it is, just that it's not in the local subnet. So remember, host A did this math earlier and figured out here are the addresses in the local subnet on the bottom left, and this server 21 address, 101221, it's not in this range, so it's not local. So host A's logic is going to be, hey, send this packet to my default router, sometimes called a default gateway, which is R1 in this case. All right, so here's the logic. It's going to, ahead of time, as soon as PCA comes up, it's going to create a route to match all other addresses, kind of like a default route, and it's going to list that default router as the next top address to get packets to. So what does that mean? Well, we can't send packets over Ethernet without a data link header added to them. So here's our Ethernet frame with that IP packet in it. We want it to get to server 21, so there's the destination IP address of server 21's IP address. But the goal now is to deliver this packet to router R1, and that destination MAC is not server 21's. It is router R1's MAC address on this left-hand interface, R1's GIG00 interface MAC address, this one. Why is that? Sometimes people get confused by that. The goal here is to get this frame across this LAN to R1 because R1's routing logic, get this, R1's routing logic is going to end up throwing away this Ethernet header and trailer and de-encapsulating that IP packet. And when it forwards it on toward that server on the right, it's going to put a new data link header on. And the next router will do the de-encapsulation and re-encapsulation. Uh, re and the next router will, and the next router will, and so on. And because routers do that, the goal of this Ethernet frame is just to get the encapsulated packet to the next router. Hence, the destination MAC is R1's GIG00 MAC address. We've already talked about how routers route, but we're going to take it another level deep here, all right? So here's a summary of the forwarding or routing logic on a router. A packet arrives, the router matches the packet's destination IP address with the IP routing table. Now that routing table lists subnets, that is sets of addresses, and the packet has an individual address. So there's a comparison to figure out which group of addresses or subnet matches the packet. Then once we match an entry in the routing table, the router will look at the local router, its own outgoing interface, and the next router's IP address that it needs to forward to, and that's going to come into play in this next level of understanding. All right, so here's a repeat of this same old topology. A is going to send a packet to server 21, and we just went over A's logic that says, hey, send the packet to default router R1 by encapsulating it in an Ethernet frame whose destination MAC is R1's MAC address, even though the packet's destination is server 21's IP address. Now, let's move up the discussion to router R1 and its routing table. It's the same routing table entries we've seen throughout this video. And here's the entry for subnet 10.1.2.0 that lists outgoing interface gig 001 up on router R1 at the top and next top address 10.1.12.2, which is router R2's IP address. So in theory, R1 should forward this packet over to router R2, and it should, as you see there, with the arrow. All right, so that's the depth of routing logic we've already talked about, but we know from our recent discussion that you can't send an IP packet over a physical link. You have to first encapsulate that packet in a data link layer frame, and in this case, for the drawing, that's an Ethernet WAN link, so we're going to encapsulate it in an Ethernet frame. So there's our Ethernet frame, and before we send it out, we have to do some things right now. We know the original packet. It has server 21's IP address in it, but the goal here is to move this packet to the next routing device, to 
R2, specifically to address 10.1.12.2. So it was like, hey, what's the MAC address that's used by the interface that has this address configured is the answer. And it's whatever that MAC address is. So the destination MAC address of this frame is going to be R2's MAC address on this gig 010 interface. So then the WAN service will deliver that Ethernet frame over here to R2. And then when R2 does its routing logic, it will de-encapsulate this IP packet and throw away the Ethernet header and trailer. Now we are close to the end of this process finally, but router R2 here receives that packet. Now R2 is directly connected to subnet 10120, and that's the correct term, a connected subnet. And we have a connected route for it. In fact, when you look at the routing table with commands, you'll see a C meaning connected. And one thing that's interesting about such routes is it has an outgoing interface, but there's no next hop address. And that seems intuitive, and it ought to, because there's no router to send the packet to next. We're going to send the packet directly to the destination, in this case, server 21 here. And that changes what happens with that encapsulation step. So once again, R2 wants to forward the packet that it de-encapsulated. It can't send the packet over the physical link. It must first add an Ethernet header and trailer, because the outgoing interface is an Ethernet interface. So it adds this Ethernet framing around the original packet. The packet still has server 21's IP address as the destination IP address, but now, because we're sending it directly to the destination, it finally has server 21's MAC address in the Ethernet header. Hey, study group folks. Here's my advice about where to go from here. This is a top five topic, but don't let that stress you out. Just keep going. Keep moving through the material. We're going to revisit this over and over and over, and you're going to get reminded of it. Uh, so you'll almost learn it by accident just by paying attention throughout the rest of the material. Here's a copy of the topology for the interview review, review activity. You should definitely do that. As always, give it a few days before you do it. But the requirements are that you talk about A, sending a packet to server S2, but it focuses on the layer three logic on the hosts and the routers. And I don't ask you to detail what's going on with encapsulation like I did toward the end of this video. So a little bit less than uh, what I went over here in this video. As far as the book goes, the one thing is the matching book section. And I definitely want you to do that. All right. There's a different example there, a little bit different detail on the links. It gives you enough of a different perspective where I think you'll get a lot out of using that as well. Hey, that was a lot of detail, wasn't it? But hey, I know you can get it. If you want to move on to the next topic, it picks up a few more protocols, so you can click on the left to do that. But if you're ready for that interview review video that I just mentioned on this topic, click on that video on the right. Hey, thanks for hanging out. I'll talk to you soon.